Welcome to another episode of Dr. Kamini Rao's Masterclass. It is believed that caring for the mind is as crucial as caring for your body. Good health care involves paying attention not only to the physical health, but also to the habits, behaviors and emotions of an individual. Mental health is just as important as physical health and people with mental health conditions deserve as much support and compassion as people with physical health conditions. We do not dismiss broken bones, so how can we dismiss broken minds? Nothing can be more terrifying than battling with your mind every single day. But what does mental health need? It needs more sunlight, more candor and more unashamed conversation. Having said that, I open this episode with Dr. Prabhat Chandra on board viewers. She is a professor and head of psychiatry at Nimhans and specialized in women and mental health. Setting up goals for generations to follow with her illustrious career, she initiated the first dedicated perinatal psychiatric service in a public health setting. Yes, you heard it right, a public health setting including a mother baby inpatient psychiatric unit. How wonderful. Welcome to the show Dr. Prabha. Thank it you, Dr. is indeed a pleasure because we always look at women as the caregivers and she is giving all the time, but we never look at her mind and ever ask her what is it that she is going through. And it is wonderful to see that you have been taking the woman through the entire period of her life, menarche to menopause and looking at the mind which actually does not appear to the doctor like you would see physical medicine. And when you did mention about this in one of our programs, I felt that it was such an important part that both the society as well as the medical profession is yet to wake up and understand that men are different from women their hormones are different and yet they need a lot more care and concern because they not only bear the babies, they bear the generation and they need that support. So, let us start with you Dr. Prabha, how did you really get into medicine knowing fully well that your full family has been into fields other than medicine like military and navy that must have been a tough task is not it. Yes, I mean, you know, I was somebody right from childhood, I was a very determined person. I would read a lot and read not just story books, but a whole range of uh, books and try to understand human behavior, history, what is happening in people's lives. So I think I was sort of, you know, driven and gradually sort of going towards a field which is more people oriented. Um, so when I told my parents that I want to do medicine, they were pretty surprised. Uh, they thought I might become a journalist you know, because of my passion for words. Um, but uh, I was again, like I said, I was quite determined and uh, they were apprehensive because not a single doctor in the family, like you said, and they, they were used to this whole traditional model of your father's a doctor, hands over the clinic to you and you sort of take it on. Um, but you know, I think they were very modern parents. Uh, they, they trusted my intuition that I will be a good doctor. Uh, and sort of encouraged me and fortunately for me, you know, we were from a middle class family, dad was in the government, mom was not working, so uh, they could have never afforded a very high paying medical college fee, etc. Uh, fortunately for me, I got into a government medical college, the Lady Harding Medical College, so my fees were very, very uh, minimal. You know, minimal. Uh, and uh, yeah, so since then the journey was awesome and I think they are now really happy that uh, they encourage me despite all their misgivings and the family's apprehensions about getting me into medicine. Yeah, but you know, when you say that you got into medicine, I think to serve the people perhaps and perhaps understand people, most of the time being you know uh, determined to get into medicine to serve the people, uh, being intuitive would be one of the better characters in you. To understand people, you must listen. Therefore, God says you got two ears but one mouth, so listen more and talk less. Have you actually followed that? Because psychiatry is all about listening and counselling, so listening more, counselling less, non-judgmental, do you think these are your mantras? 
Absolutely. I mean, in fact, you know, uh, my husband complains that I don't talk enough at home. I, I think I've been sort of so trained to listen to people, uh, to ask questions from people. So if they say something, I'll usually not just take it at face value because I know when people say something, behind that there's a lot more. So to be able to uh, understand them better, to ask questions, to be curious, you know, and I tell this to all my students as well, be curious about the person. What has happened in this person's life and what is going on currently in the person's life. So those are some of the sort of, it comes with training. I wouldn't say that I was born with it, but uh, you know, to just be very cautious that to not to jump into conclusions prematurely, to be able to understand the person and my patients appreciate that a lot. I've got a lot of feedback from them saying, you know, you don't sort of label us within the first half an hour or first 20 minutes. Don't say we have depression, we have anxiety, give a pill and just give it. You know, you are able to listen to us, you're able to understand us. Um, I, I'm also one of those who take I, the patient along with me. So everything that I do, I discuss with them and I say, you know, this is what I've understood about you. Am I right? Is there anything I'm missing? Would you like to tell me anything more? Um, constantly assuring them about confidentiality, privacy, because those are such key things, particularly in our culture, where everything is talked about. So I think those are some of my uh, qualities, which I discovered very early on, even when I was a third year medical student. Um, you know, I remember there was a lady who had three miscarriages and she was in the ward and she was crying and we were just doing our routine round the third years do to present to the professor when the professor comes uh, BP pulse you know checking blood bleeding PV etc and I just sat with her and I said you know what is making you cry and she talked to me about how she was from a very traditional patriarchal family three miscarriages worried that her husband would leave her get married again pressure to have a male child all of that and and she felt so much better after that and she would look out for me even when she would come for follow-ups and meet me. So I think that kind of gave me an idea that there is more to people than their bodies, than the illness they have. There is a lot which goes on behind that and it's very important to address it and at that point nobody was addressing it. Nobody was addressing women's health, particularly uh, perinatal or you know obstetric or gynecological mental health. Yeah, and it's also said that when we talk about psychosomatic diseases, I'm sure we will be able to put the human being as in, in disease perspective, all diseases will be psychosomatic. The uh, proportion of psycho and somatic may be different, but as soon as a person walks in, the way you greet the person and the way you recognize the person if it's a follow-up, if you've been able to recollect what you have actually spoken earlier and say, welcome and how are you feeling today, how was the fever or something like that which tells them that you have not forgotten them, you can see that the worry lines on their faces actually disappear. And this is what I think uh, psychologists and psychiatrists of the yester years actually uh, had that in them compared to the present day psychiatrists before even they speak you find that they have already got the prescription ready. I feel very much in this particular area that the power of silence as a language is so important because you will have a second chance to say something. Because once you have made your this thing, the poor woman has actually come to talk to you. Once she shuts up, it's very difficult to get her to open her mouth. And many of the problems that I find in the area of infertility, for which I am known for, I find that that golden period of the first hour when I talk to them is the time when I can get the maximum benefit. And looking at the perinatal medicine that you have, I feel it's extremely important that what you've done is a human service and that too in the public sector, believe me, that was an uphill task. Having said this now to you, I feel how do you take a child from example, an, an adolescent child from menarche to menopause and look at the mindset of a child say, for example, when they just start their periods. How many schools where the teachers would have actually explained to the child of the you know oncoming um, menses, the parents say, the teachers must say, teachers say the parents must say, then the society says that it is the responsibility of both, 
finally, there is nobody's responsibility and they get to know it in a very promiscuous way. What do you feel? I completely agree with you, Dr. Kamini. I think that, you know, discussions about the body, about reproduction, about sexuality, both with girls and boys need to start much early on and not wait for menarche to happen and then everybody panicking and saying, oh, she's got her period now, today she can't go to school tomorrow, the child doesn't know what's going on. And, you know, as, as you, we were discussing uh, that the age of menarche is coming down quite a bit. And so these girls are quite young when, when it happens. So I think bringing all these conversations into the drawing room and I also think talking about menarche as a as an event, as a development, you know, what does it really mean? What will happen? Uh, what should you, you not be worried about? I think a lot of mothers think, like you rightly said, the teachers will say, or many mothers I have spoken to will say, no, no, you know, nowadays girls, they talk to each other, so uh, there's no need for me to tell. They are much smarter than our generation. We didn't know anything, but that's not the point. I think coming from a mother uh, who has experienced it, you know, what, what does the pain mean? What does it actually feel like? What can you do? How can you protect your clothes? I mean, these are simple things which I think need to be discussed. To my mind, I think even fathers need to discuss it. Yes. I mean, why should all of this be like a woman's job or a woman's thing, you know? I think these are conversations that need to come out because these, this is going to happen, this is natural, and it should not be something traumatic for a girl. Um, you know, families will still, do these celebrations, you know, around menarche if something happens. So even if they don't do something big, they do some puja and things like that. But I think the amount of time they spend on these rituals, it's very important to also spend a much more time in preparing the girl for what is going to happen. Because you must remember that that is also a time when adolescence is going on. It's not just her body, her mind is also changing. So at the time of adolescence, what happens is there's a lot of pruning of neurons which is going on. You know, there's impulsivity, there's emotions, there's angst. A lot of that happens. And it's only in the 20s where actually the brain kind of settles down. So it's not a myth that adolescence is full of angst. So you're talking about a girl who is going through all of that and going through changes in her body. Imagine the kind of support that she actually needs, which is what parents and the society really should actually be providing. And it's not just the mother, the aunts, the cousins the ajis, the grandmothers, I mean, everybody's around. Uh, people can actually offer to have those conversations. Conversations are about what, how many marks you got in class, you know, uh, which dance class are you going to, uh, those, those are, are the kind, kind of things which are discussed, you know, how much you're achieving, how much you're achieving. But the actual things which are more meaningful for a young girl, are not actually discussed. So I'm, I think you're completely right. But I would also ask this question, is it really necessary that when a girl attains menarche to celebrate it, why are you making a public issue of a very private thing? Why are you putting on display the body of this girl, which is really not required? Because in olden days, when they did this function, it was to say that she was ready for marriage. Now, girls are getting menarche at the age of 9 and 10. Is she ready for marriage at 9 and 10? Why is it that boys who have their voice broken or they have a the same change in voice, why are they not doing a function for that? But you know, that is the whole irony, isn't it, of the woman's body being uh, something which everybody can talk about, you know. Uh, in, in many ways and we are seeing that. So I think that's that what you're saying is very right. I think the celebration should be internal to tell the girl, look, this is what's happened. It's a very natural process. You're growing up. Uh, it's an indication that your body is functioning normally. Uh, so, you know, be happy and let's see how we can make this whole next journey of your life into a joyful journey, into a healthy journey. So I think the celebration should be something which she can understand and not something which is definitely not something which is publicly displayed. But unfortunately, it's become like one milestone uh, celebration in many, many cultures, in many, many societies, even in India, happening even now, including in educated families. And I think people need to rethink. I don't know how many of them have actually asked the girl, what did this whole thing mean to you? How did you feel when the whole world and your community came to know that you've had your period? Like, how did that make you feel? Nobody's ever asked her that. Yeah, but Prabha, if they're going to have a period at the age of nine, 
the girl, poor girl is going to say all the new clothes she's getting and the sweets she's getting and all the kind of uh, I mean, they're, they're only looking at that. Yeah, but I think they may also be feeling, you know, something's happening to my body. Like, what is it? And and children are very, very intelligent. They understand what's going on. I think to me, as a mental health professional, giving voice to children from since they are little, to be able to actually encourage them to talk and to be able to listen to them is so important. So I was just talking to my daughter this morning. You know, we have a fantastic relationship. And she was nine when she had her period. That was pretty early. Very young. It was a challenge to me as a mother, even as a mental health professional, it was a challenge because I didn't expect it. I thought I had more time to kind of talk to her about these things. But it happened. And then we had very frank conversations. And she still remembers that I treated her with so much respect. I understood the fact that when I tell her something, she'll be able to gather that knowledge. I encouraged her to ask questions. And I think rather than making it a hush-hush thing or something to be embarrassed about, it was all there in the open. It was a very body positive kind of a approach. And I think, you know, she really appreciates the, the approach I took. So I think more and more parents should be able to do that for their children. But it's also another thing that the first time, of course, they celebrate. But then subsequently, they make them sit outside for three days. This is to say that you can take rest. But don't you think they can take rest without actually making a big noise about it and ask them to sit outside, don't go here, don't go there? You know, it makes it so, you know, uncomfortable. Absolutely, Kamini. I, you know, when my mother used to tell me about these practices, I used to be like, why, why did they ever do these things, you know, in her time? I see it happening even now. And this whole thing about the woman is impure when she's having her period, she can't come in, she can't do her daily chores, she can't enter the kitchen. I think these are things which make her feel even worse psychologically, you know. So the so-called rest is actually causing more trauma inside her. They do it because they have no choice in many families. But I think more and more women, young women are articulating and protesting and saying these are meaningless, you know. In fact, in infertility, they're scared to go and sit outside because they know that they've not conceived. So they are sort of telling me that I don't want to sit outside because again, I'll get another big shout from my mother-in-law. Yeah. So now going into the next phase about a little bit more on the adolescent phase, about the third or fourth standard or fifth standard, you know, the question of good touch and bad touch. You know, children now today have to be told and, uh, you know, there used to be a curriculum of sexual uh, uh, you know, education in um, children in schools and then the government took it out saying that sex education means sex. Now sex education doesn't mean sex but I think you know Prabha you can explain that sexual health means it's an overall development Absolutely. and that should be actually put in but now today the way in which that sexual health education is depicted it's almost like a book on Kama Sutra. So can you explain us? Yeah, I think, you know, a lot of uh, schools um, were, were a little worried about the whole sex education bit. And then there is this fear that if we talk about sex, then uh, women, you know, girls, young boys and uh, girls will become promiscuous and will go around having sex. But I think they don't understand that these are normal questions that children have. If they don't get it from authentic sources, they are going to go to non-authentic sources. They are going to go on internet and find out a lot of sex which is not normal which is not the usual kind of sex what is portrayed on the net sometimes can be very bizarre and very different uh, and so hiding under the blanket i have mothers coming and saying my sons my daughters are hiding under the blanket what are they watching at night and i'm saying you know they're watching stuff that you're not talking to them about you know so let let us be open about some of these apps uh, you know things which are part and parcel of our lives you know how can you how can you remove sexuality and keep it aside when it's so much integral to our lives. So I think healthy way of discussing some of these things are very important. Absolutely. Now again, getting back into your career, I mean, the struggle, the next challenge for you was the struggle and choice of psychiatry. I mean, this was a least chosen field for women, particularly, because they would say that's a leftover subject and there is no gravy in it, there's no surgery in it. And so the glamour jobs for women, whether it was dermatology or gynecology, and you didn't decide to take it because obviously you're very intuitive and you were a very person-friendly person. And 
those sort of things which is so much required for psychiatry and how did you convince your parents that you wanted to do psychiatry? Oh, it was very simple because um, my mother herself is a very intelligent, very well-read woman mm -hmm. and she attended a talk when we were uh, adolescents from a psychiatrist who would come from abroad and he gave a very nice talk I think because she came back home all charged and she told me you know what I want to talk to you about something I listened to this man he talked about adolescent problems and I think both of you are going through those problems so for me it was very reassuring, <laughs> reassuring. that you know and he kind of gave us tips about how to manage so uh, she said you know this psychiatry seems to be a fantastic field and this was when I was 12 or something like that and I think they always knew that I wanted to do it but you're so right in saying that my professors were not as happy because I did excellently in medical school they would have wanted me to do either internal medicine or pediatrics pediatrics was a, a choice that I had uh, or obstetrics my professor of obstetrics was very keen that I should you know do a, that subject and when she heard Prabha has taken psychiatry she was like psychiatry kyo liya usne you know this was in Delhi so um, and, and she was a little disappointed I think that I took up a subject like this but I think that for me this was I, if I born again I would still take up this field because even as a school child I had read Sigmund Freud's works wow. I had you know you know done a lot of reading beforehand I would sit in the library for hours and and study some of these things so I think I just sort of drifted into the something which I think was uh, was made for me really in fact if I were to say this and I wouldn't be too far away from the truth that with most of the other specialities it's more organic sort of and you know if you say add 2 plus 2 and 4 yes but here 2 plus 2 could be 22 and uh, in psychiatry it's more that you're creating that path there is no path there and with each patient with similar problems you could get different conclusions because environmental stress and genetics all mixed into the thing with the cultural uh, you know spill in you find that uh, the diagnosis today is more on symptom based rather than actually going in for a, a kind of a boxed diagnosis in psychiatry and in olden days they used to always keep them separate but today it is very much integrated with society meaning to say that we have to get them into society they don't treat them separately and stigmatize them what's your thoughts on that Absolutely. I mean, to, to give to answer to both your questions, you know, well, first of all, now psychiatry has moved from what was sort of schizophrenia and bipolar disorder alone to a whole range of problems, uh, including problems of living, including anxiety. And, and in situations like this right now, people are going through financial problems, projects that they wanted to do uh, did not take off. So there are so many uh, concerns and worries that people have that it's quite natural for the mental health to be affected. It's it's. Uh, it's not uh, not at all a surprise isn't it for things Absolutely. to happen so one of the things that i use often and it is recommended and it we, we as a good psychiatrist one should use it is what we call the ecological model now ecological model is exactly what you said you know ecological model doesn't say i've come to a psychiatrist and say you know what i'm having some anxiety symptoms not able to sleep okay acetylopram 10 milligram that doesn't work like that right so the ecological model actually looks at the development like what was your early childhood like what happened there you know what was it that triggered off that when there is a disappointment when there is a loss what kind of emotions come to your mind which get triggered again and again when there are problems you know so those are the kind of things so looking at a, a person's life course and at what points did this person go through different crises how did this person handle it what are this person's resources so at the end of every ward round, I will always ask a patient, uh, what are your strengths? You know, it's something that I routinely ask. Nobody would have ever asked them that. They would be only focusing on this person's weaknesses. You know, you get angry, you get upset. So I always ask, tell me what are your strengths? And many times I look, I don't think I have any strengths. And I'm like, please think again. I'm sure you have strengths. I'm sure you have strengths. And then sometimes they can't identify. And I will say, you know, I think your strength is the fact that you were brave enough to ask for help. Even that, that is a strength, is, absolutely. you know, it's a strength that, you know, you have a loving relationship with your child or with your husband or with your sister, you know, despite all these problems, 
you're still surviving. So I think it is about understanding the person's whole life, the cultural milieu that the person is living in, the stigma which is surrounding mental health, and the fact that the men mental health is something which is not talked about. So unless you you capture the person in her whole uh, sort of you know longitudinal and cross-sectional way, you're not going to be able to help that person. That's true because I've always seen that when you take uh, the person who comes to you, it's never on the first visit that you can make a diagnosis. It perhaps takes you as much as three to four visits because just as you're trying to evaluate the patient, the patient is evaluating you. And so she wants to know how much she can give and she will give you a little bit and then she will test you and then she will test you again. So by the time you really get to know her, she would have assessed you. You know, trust is so important. I mean, even as a, as a gynecologist, you know that when a woman trusts you with her body, you know, there's so much trust involved. I'm trusting you with my body to prod it, to look at it, to assess it. But can you imagine the level of trust that is required when you're revealing your mind? It's a lot of trust which is needed because the mind is a minefield sometimes. There are all kinds of thoughts going on there. There are thoughts about, you know, uh, not feeling good about oneself, there are past thoughts which come in, there are experiences, there is anger, anger sometimes at people who are close to you. Now, to be able to talk about all this requires that the psychiatrist instills that kind of trust in the person, you know, and that's my job as a mental health professional. It's not the patient's job to trust you. It's my job to make sure that the patient, uh, the woman, the man who's in front of me is able to trust me enough and, and to be very alert to the fact that right now the trust is not there. I need to build it more. I need to be very cautious. I need to be non-judgmental. So I get so many people. I get young men who want to become women, yes. you know. And, and there is so much of lack of trust in the system right now about that. And, and how much, how difficult it is for somebody to actually talk about it or about sexuality or something as simple as I'm not loving my child. You know, it's not unusual. When a woman is going through her own issues, when she's going through violence, her own trauma, she, she doesn't feel about the child. And the, and the mother-in-law, the mother is saying, why aren't you feeling? Look at this beautiful baby. Why are you not feeling enough? And the mother should be able to tell me why she's not feeling for the child. So sometimes it's about, you know, as simple and thing as, I'm not feeling enough for the child. Now for you as a mental health professional, it may be something that you can understand. But for a woman to be able to talk to you about the fact that she sometimes gets angry at the baby, that she gets negative thoughts about the baby, she wishes that she never had this baby. These are things which uh, she needs to trust you a lot. And I think that's something that as a mental health professional, I find the most important thing is to be able to get the person to trust you. But does it happen that, uh, you know, not liking the baby or uh, not wanting to have the baby could emanate from some kind of a family crisis or is just that she doesn't like the husband and therefore she's had a fight. Now she feels that even if she leaves the husband, now she's burdened with the child. However good the child may be, it still will be a burden because when the child is so small, you know, the court will always say you'll have to keep the child and so it will be a burden for her. So maybe a lot of things will be going on in her mind and also the financial part of it. And so all these things rolled into it, she becomes ashamed you know, and she would be thinking, what will everyone think of me? And so this kind of a complex thought process that goes in, she feels, what will you think of her if she says that? Absolutely. And this is something I find is such a complex yes. thing. It's not like surgery and the medicine. Absolutely. So this is you something know. which so you can So this is a happen. condition which is now being called a mother-infant bonding problem. Now what we do is we sort of look at whether, you know, is it because of depression? So because sometimes if a woman is depressed, she's kind of listless and no interest. Sometimes it's because of anxiety, because she feels that you know, she may harm the baby in some way, that if she doesn't lift it properly or something like that. Sometimes it's about lactation is not going okay and there's so much pressure, you know, why is there no milk, why is there no milk and you know, the baby is suffering, the baby is crying. So that's that pressure which is going on and that is causing her so much anxiety. Sometimes there's what we call obsessive thoughts. So in the postpartum period, there can be obsessive thoughts that, you know, uh, if I go near the baby, something will happen to the baby or I may hit the baby. Or th these are thoughts which she may not do, 
but these are thoughts which are coming and this is a condition she may have it because of that or it may be a pure bonding disorder a pure bonding disorder is basically like you said invariably related to trauma past trauma so we had this mother who was sexually abused in her childhood when you know and her sister was sexually abused by a very close male relative uh, she never wanted to have girl children she said if i have a girl child not because of anything else because if i have a girl child that relative is still around and my babies will be vulnerable to that abuse